Good evening and welcome to the California Thoracic Society Friday evening educational webinar series. We really appreciate you spending some of your Friday night with us. We work really hard to bring you very relevant, informative educational presentations and tonight we have a great one. Uh, tonight's presentation was developed by the California Thoracic Society in collaboration with 4D Medical. Uh, thank you very much to 4D Medical for helping to sponsor and make this educational presentation possible for all of us. Tonight's presentation is titled Triage Unexplained Dyspnea with Advanced Imaging. And there will be an opportunity for live Q&A at the end of the webinar this evening. Um, we really hope you stay till the end. And if so, please use the Zoom Q&A functionality for your questions. It's a little button at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen that says Q&A with an icon with a question mark in it. Um, you can enter questions anytime throughout the webinar. We will answer all of them at the end of the webinar. Um, if for any reason you do have problems with the Q&A functionality, feel free to back use the backup, the, the old chat function. We'll be monitoring it together. Um, our esteemed speakers tonight are Dr. Greg Mogul and David Westenkirchner. Dr. Greg Mogul is fellow of the American College of Radiology and the chief medical officer of 4D Medical. Dr. Mogul is a practicing radiologist with a distinguished career spanning medicine, engineering, government, academia, and industry. Known for his dedication in making healthcare more affordable, effective, and compassionate, he previously held key leadership roles at Kaiser Permanente, where he was instrumental in establishing lung cancer screening. A proud U.S. Army Medical Corps veteran, Medical Corps veteran, Dr. Mogul has received numerous awards for his service. He has also served on the board of the College of Liberal Arts at Temple University. As a frequent national speaker and expert in advanced medical technology, Dr. Mogul continues to contribute to teaching, clinical practice, and research. He resides in the San Francisco Bay Area. David Westenkirchner is a licensed respiratory therapist with 15 years of experience in the field and currently serves as the global clinical product manager at 4D Medical. David earned his bachelor's degree in respiratory therapy from Indiana University and began his career with a pediatric internship at Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. His expertise includes ventilator management, therapeutic modalities, and critical care, with a special interest in asthma and cystic fibrosis. After almost a decade at Riley, he transitioned to the medical device sector, working as a clinical specialist for a ventilator manufacturer, and later joined the respiratory division at Olympus. At Olympus, David educated, educated clinicians on endotherapy devices, navigational bronchoscopy, and alternatives to lung volume reduction surgery. David is, a dedic is dedicated to improving patient outcomes and leveraging breakthrough technology to enhance respiratory care. Thank you again to 4D Medical, and I now present Dr. Mogul and David Westenkirchner. Thank you again. Thank you so much for the kind introductions. Um, and I um, <clears throat> I appreciate uh, my California colleagues joining on a Friday night. Um, and, you know, David and I hope to make this an interesting, lively presentation. Uh, we hope to make it a practical presentation. Um, emphasizing that what we are describing here are not technologies that may come to pass. These are technologies that are available in practice currently, these FDA approved technologies. And so, um, you know, we're, we're excited to sort of share with you our vision for how they can be deployed today in your practices um, and in the future. Um, and so um, maybe we'll just get started. Um, David, do uh, you, uh, you wanna make the first slide? Thanks. So th the talk tonight, I really wanted to sort of shape the talk around a clinical problem rather than around a technology. And I hope you share my opinion, um, my time in practice, and the number of chest x-rays and CTs that I read um, for patients who had this as their history and, and little else. Next slide. The, the clinical problem of unexplained dyspnea is is large. I, I'm embarrassed to tell a group of pulmonologists that, but um, you know better than I do that patients have difficulty reporting their symptoms. They're not um, always reliable reporters of their symptoms. Two patients may, may report a very similar feeling using very different words, but it's clear that the impact on these patients' lives um, is, 
is very significant. Um, these patients, as you probably also know, often bounce around the healthcare system, um, whether they are in um, integrated networks like Kaiser Permanente, Intermountain, and others, or whether they are in open fee-for-service um, systems. Nonetheless, there is a real lack of a standard process by which patients get initially um, evaluated and determinations are made to whom they should go see. Um, you know, they, they often come back to the same or multiple primary care uh, practitioners. They, they can see cardiologists, they can see pulmonologists, they could go in a number of directions and often do. Um, they're, they're highly concerned about what might be wrong with them. And worst of all, um, there's a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of folks who report this symptom who have no organic lung disease. Um, now at the, at the primary care physician level or at your level as specialists, you know, this figure of four, up to 4% of all primary care consultations are for dyspnea is from 2011, well before COVID. And um, uh, um, anecdotally, this number is much, much higher. Um, uh, and of course, not only are the symptoms protean, but the causes are protean, even uh, involving more than more than one or two, the, the obvious uh, cardio and pulmonary systems, but involving other uh, organic and as well as, as psychosomatic symptoms. Um, and fundamentally, primary care physicians in their time-constrained practices often are not well armed to, I, to identify what tests are necessary. There's extreme variability, as you well know, uh, in what tests patients have had by the time they've arrived at your office. Um, and, uh, you know, although, although, as we said, the majority who do have organic disease have, have cardiopulmonary disease, deconditioning and many other causes, um, are out there. I want to really especially emphasize the last two, uh, among, uh, among patients reporting, um, this is a, a major cause of frustration with the healthcare system. Patients feel uh, unheard. Patients are frustrated by what often takes years to either diagnose or to be quickly um, reassured that they have no uh, worrisome or dangerous cause for their symptoms. And the healthcare systems in general, the, whether it's from fee-for-service Medicare or in private insurance or, or integrated systems, the, the drag of these patients, the time these patients take away from primary care and specialty physicians from treating and uh, diagnosing and treating patients who really do need their care is a non-trivial matter. Um, so what's needed? Uh, you know, we certainly have developed a lot of effective clinical pathways. You have them in your practice. We have them in imaging. And as we see, you know, the, the approach to to illnesses and symptoms as common as this one, the lack of a standardized pathway for the workup uh, is, is a notable absence. Now, it's not that there aren't standardized pathways, that there are many standardized pathways, and they are very impacted by what tools and what comfort levels people have. You know, of course, the, the primary care doctor is going to do an initial investigation clinically and usually obtain some kind of imaging. What, what I've learned from talking to both pulmonologists and primary care physicians is if you've talked to one about how they initially work up patients who are short of breath, then you've talked to one. And, um, and, and so um, the, the, that lack of standardization is often what leads to the problems on the prior page of long delays and a lot of healthcare resources and time being eaten up. This is a um, you know, really interesting fact that we found in preparing for this talk is that um, uh, patients who are referred to pulmonologists end up uh, having um, having a, a much better alignment of their initial diagnosis with what they are, or at least the original initial differential diagnosis of what they are actually diagnosed with in the end. And yet, um, uh, our company, which is which is structured around bringing additional analysis using exactly the tools that are currently in your hands and your primary care doctor's hands. We're not here to talk about hardware. This is all software and analytics. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we exist uh, in Australia and here in the United States. And um, we hear stories in both countries of patients who go to cardiologists two or three times, four times sometimes. There's a, 
depending how that relationship is established with the primary care doctor. So this is something where we, we really want to look at a pathway that can, first of all, identify who the right patients uh, are that you should see first and, you know, using these tools for triage. So next slide. So just to sort of sum up, we've got this problem between um, not only uh, symptoms and, and the presence or absence of disease, symptoms and even identifying which organ system may be, uh, may be uh, uh, in question, um, and a variety of tools that are used in non-standardized non -standardized ways. And so uh, our approach to this is, as I said, to use the tools that are already in use, especially the, we're going to be talking about imaging here, imaging tools specifically in the form of chest CT, um, and extracting additional analysis from the chest CT to demonstrate a whole new series of structural and structural and functional findings from the lungs that can really dramatically change the course of the patient's pathway through the clinical system. So, you know, simply at the at the level of primary care or at the level of a pulmonologist, you know, is this complex disease, this, this complex set of symptoms, is it even cardiac related? Is it more likely to be psychosomatic or, or cardiac? And then once we can sort of align patients in, uh, in, in, and triage them to patients who have a much higher likelihood of having a primary pulmonary diagnosis, to patients who have a much less likely, a much lower likelihood of primary pulmonary diagnosis, then additional tools that can be applied early and again, using existing technologies in your hands with imaging to actually start to quantify and diagnose restrictive and obstructive diseases, and most importantly, identify the patients who are going to be good candidates for intervention and other treatments. So what are these technologies? What, what is the, you know, what is the secret sauce here that, um, that, that we have to add um, in, in helping you, number one, get what I'll call better patients, get patients with uh, information sets that allow you to begin a much more effective completion of their diagnostic cycle or even start treatment earlier. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, David, who's actually going to talk about our technology from sort of the cellular level up. So David, if you'd like to take over. Thank you, Dr. Mogul. So I want to start talking about kind of the, the technology that's underlying what we can currently pull off of existing imaging. And this is going to be, I'm going to refer to this as this lung ventilation analysis software. Uh, this is kind of the steps that we take to be able to provide you with the report. Uh, what kind of, what is the information on the report? But how exactly does it work? So the first thing we're going to require is the input. And this is going to utilize a non-contrast paired chest CT looking at um, breath holding for deep inspiration compared to deep expiration. So we're going to try to get our patients as close as we can to TLC and FRC. Uh, and then after we've done that, we move on to step two, which on the lung fields, we will then place voxels uh, across the patient's lung field. So a voxel is a three-dimensional pixel. Uh, and the best two words I've been able to use to describe this technology has been voxel kinematics. This is essentially looking at what happens through the movement of those voxels and being able to then quantify that motion. So we're then going to do regional image matching and be able to see where did that voxel start at the beginning of the breath and where did it end up? And being able to then quantify that motion as a surrogate for tissue displacement is going to allow us to pull some data from our already existing CTs. So we take a look at all of these voxels and the ones that were average across the entire lung field for their motion are gonna show up as normal and be represented by green. The runs, the voxels that move, uh, move less are gonna be showing up as red, indicative of little to no ventilation. And those that were greater than the average are gonna show up as blue. And then from this, we have our output where we're then able to take this color mapping and distribute it across as a ventilation overlay on top of the grayscale CT images, and also allowing us to pull some quantitative, quantitative data from that information as well. So what is the clinical value that I'm going to be able to take from utilizing this lung ventilation analysis software? So we're looking at first a healthy male in his mid thirties, and we're looking at two different comparative pictures. We have grayscale CT information from the initial scan compared to a follow-up scan that was done three months later. 
Uh, and what we're looking at here is we have our grayscale information, and then we see that we have our ventilation overlay. First thing I want to draw your eyes attention to is the color coding. So the way that this is done is that based on the total average of all the voxels, normal ventilation distribution is going to show up relatively green. Little to no ventilation is going to show up as red, as we can see on the periphery of this patient. And then we will see blue as areas that we're receiving higher distribution of ventilation, which are indicative of compensation across the lungs. And then we have two metrics that we see down here underneath. We have VH standing for ventilation heterogeneity, which is looking at the evenness in the distribution of that ventilation across the lungs. And then we have VDP, which we are borrowing from functional MRI, which stands for ventilation defect percentage, which is essentially adding up all the areas of underventilated lungs, all the areas of red and turning them into a percentage. So we start off with the bullet point on the far left that this is a validated assessment of regional lung function. Compared to pulmonary function testing, this essentially pulmonary function testing is a global objective overview of the lungs functioning as just one individual balloon. Whereas we are able to now take this technology, apply it to the lungs and look at regional function down to a low bar level. And then bullet point number two, we have a reliable repeatability of findings where I know that this says this follow-up scan was done three months later, but if it was the same patient, whether it was the next day or three months later, as long as we have not done anything different for this patient, we haven't put them on any bronchodilators, we haven't given them steroids, we certainly haven't taken a piece of their lung out or deployed a valve, I would expect to see not a whole lot of variability between the patient's scans. This is exactly what we see here. The VH and the VDP are a little bit different, but they're not statistically significant compared to each other. So this is looking at a healthy individual, and now we are looking at a diseased individual. So this is going to pull in points three and four, where we're now able to quantify regional ventilation defects and also provide ourselves with effective monitoring for uh, disease itself and also impact of treatment to these patients, whether that was from a pharmaceutical intervention, lung volume reduction surgery, we've deployed a valve with this patient. Interesting background for this patient, 36-year-old male, progressive silicosis, one of the hallmarks for silicosis is fibrotic tissue, typically up into the apices. And so what happened for this individual is they came in and wanted a treatment or some sort of experimental treatment. What can you do to increase my quality of life and decrease my work of breathing? So this patient underneath underwent an experimental treatment at the time of whole lung lavage, and we received an initial scan pre-treatment with a follow-up scan three months later. And just comparing the grayscale coronal images, we can see that there is a lot of fibrotic tissue that is occurring in the right upper lobe. And comparing from the initial scan to three months later, we can see that radiographically, Greg, I'm sure you would agree with this, that there doesn't seem to be much change and even a worsening of the condition. However, this did not match up with the patient's subjectiveness to how they felt that their work of breathing had decreased. And now if we look at the ventilation overlay comparative on the initial, we see that the right upper lobe being red, little to no ventilation. So it's not really receiving much of the ventilation. And the, the ventilation that has now been shifted or compensated for by the left lung with this rather large plume of blue. But we can see that after the initial scan to the three month follow-up scan, the right upper lobe is now returned to normal. The area of compensation that was there prior is still, ex still exists, it's just not as, as intense and the ventilation heterogeneity and the VDP have both dropped down to just about outside of normal. So we're able to see from a radiographic perspective, sometimes certain things cannot be appreciated even from chest CTs and also being able to look at, depending on pulmonary function testing where there are a global measure, we were able to actually look at the regional ventilation function and peel back and see if there are any defects. So what does this look like on a report? So being able to see beyond the lung structure with this functional analysis, again, it utilizes a non-contrast paired chest CT. So a deep breath hold in and deep breath hold out. This is post imaging processing software as a service. There is no extra radiation that the patient is subjected to. This information sits already in that CT. It just needs to have this algorithm run on it. And these can also be run retrospectively. So again, we have your CT, and we have some qualitative images. These are axial slices. Now I know we're only looking at three, but we have the upper, middle, and lower. We also have the ventilation overlay accordingly to those axial slices as well, with the difference in the color showing us the changes and the shifts 
to the distribution of ventilation. We have the ventilation distribution graph, which is just a graphical representation of the distribution of the ventilation throughout the patient's lungs from a graphical standpoint. And we get some quantitative metrics. We get inspiratory volume, expiratory volume, change in volume, which we can use as kind of a quality control method to make sure that the patient actually had a good coaching through taking a breath hold in and breath hold out during their CT. We can quantify our VDP for the patient, kind of gathering up all those areas of being underventilated. And we also look at our ventilation heterogeneity. We can take it a step further and segment that out into small scale, comparing low bar to low bar, and also large scale looking at uh, you know, upper to lower or left to right. And so being able to take this, Greg, if you could please go more into some of the clinical utility that this lung yeah. ventilation analysis software Ab can provide. Yeah, absolutely. And you, um, you, you know, this seems somewhat esoteric at this point in the sense that it's a very interesting technology, but how will this apply in a, in, in a busy practice? And, and, and essentially we train the radiologist or you and you, of course, you get a report, but but also as the radiologists are reading these reports, that when you order it, there's simply another phase available like a PET CT. There's traditional CT phases and then that heat map overlay. And really it's a very quick addition. It's one or two lines added to a radiology report when, when the workup is for unexplained dyspnea. It adds the degree of ventilation heterogeneity and whether the patient would it is likely or not or less likely to have their symptoms being caused by functional changes in their lungs. Now, obviously, they have the structural changes. So, if the structure is normal and the ventilation heterogeneity is normal, then we can quickly, re, even perhaps at the level of a primary care doctor, but certainly you can use this as an additional assurance to worried patients in this age of long COVID that they that even with this additional testing which again is only software following their already ordered high resolution or inspiratory expiratory CT that you're really confident that they don't have some underlying uh, organic lung disease or the reports will be mismatched in, in the sense that the structures are normal and the radiologist will give you the report and say, there's nothing wrong with this patient. But in fact, we can show you that in these patients, we have many, many cases and I'm gonna show you two very quickly that give you examples, patients where the structures are normal and the same way you might do a SPECT CT ventilation portion and see abnormalities in function that either are, are, are either too subtle for the structural changes, i.e. small airways disease, or too early. So here are two cases um, that came from the same clinic a day or two apart, have very similar, um, very similar histories. These are patients who've had multiple visits um, with unexplained dyspnea, and some have had uh, PFTs, some have not. But in the end, they got to the point where an inspiratory expiratory CT was ordered. And I have these on my packs, and you know, I, I go over these cases in real time with, with our pulmonologist partners and radiology partners. Um, the, the, the CTs were completely normal on both these cases. And in this case, when we did the ventilation color mapping, we showed that the heterogeneity is in that normal zone, well below 40. And this patient really at this point is able to be, uh, uh, assuming you know there aren't other concerns that you or the primary care doctor have, we can much more confidently say this patient is much less likely to have a structural abnormality in the lungs as a source of their, of their symptoms, deconditioning perhaps, cardiac causes, et cetera. And then next slide, which was two days later, literally the same pulmonologist, a 71-year-old who had had suspected COVID about um, six months ago and had persistent uh, ongoing shortness of breath. And this patient, again, had a completely normal CT, structurally nothing there, um, but actually had an elevated ventilation heterogeneity. And actually, if you look at the lingula, there, um, and the, you can see that there's a, a sort of like that original slide we showed you of the silicosis patient. There's an area of pretty significant reduced ventilation with, in the right lower lobe, some very significant compensatory change. But, but really, with uh, early charge, the quantitative values are, are initially what I have people look at. And this elevated, uh, this elevated VH 
did put this patient on a, a smoother path to be triaged to a pulmonologist from the primary care doctor that saw them. Now, this is function, and we work in combining structure, which is traditional structure, as I've shown you in these cases, with function. Function is the new additive here. But we have a completely different way to work with you using, again, proven FDA-cleared uh, technologies that are applicable to the same CT in defining the structure in a much more quantitative way and doing it very quickly within your existing reports. So I'm going to let David talk about this technology next. So thanks, Greg. So we first talked about being able to look at ventilation function, and this is going to be looking at structural analysis as well. And this is, we're kind of taking a departure from this voxel kinematics, and instead we are utilizing Hounsfield thresholding. Uh, so we're just going to be able to take a look at the difference between, again, it does require an inspiratory and an expiratory paired CT. So if you're already having the patient get that, you would be able to receive the functional uh, lung ventilation analysis software and also looking at the structural lung density analysis as well, uh, comparing the difference in Hounsfield thresholding between inspiratory to expiratory to then be able to look at tissue density levels to be able to determine and visualize and not only visualize, but also quantify whether tissue is normal, uh, looking at areas of early disease for functional small airways disease uh, or areas that are considered to be advanced disease uh, indicative of emphysematic destruction. Uh, and so this also is generated out into a report uh, and on the physician summary report here, we do get some key slice visuals. So we do have uh, the coronal slice. We have a couple of mid-sagittal slices as well as axial slices. And then we have a quick summary on here to look at on the across the total lung field involvement, how much of the patient's tissue was considered to be healthy or normal versus functional small airways disease versus emphysematic destruction. You also get your inspiratory and expiratory volumes for the total lung and also left versus right. And then it can take these different tint, uh, density levels for tissue health, and we can break them down into the low bar level uh, for their involvement uh, as well for structural defects. And why would somebody want to look at functional density analysis in terms of structure? And the next slide I'm going to show you is one of the, my favorite slides that I like to go through with physicians. Uh, and this is looking at four different subjects that are all within gold twos uh, based off of their FEV1s. And so given this information, gold twos, FEV1, 61 to 62, if I was to ask you to just treat these patients based off of this information, uh, it's probably a broad coverage, right? You're probably going to be treating them relatively the same. But now we get a little bit more information. And now we have radiographic grayscale CTs, and I can start to see that there seems to be a difference in the appearance for some of these CTs, in particular subject C and subject D. But I don't know if that's inspiratory or the expiratory image. I'm not sure if this is air traffic from looking at emphysema. And if I am, what is its involvement in the lung field? And can I quantify that? Because that is not something that we are requiring of radiologists to be able to do. Uh, and so this is where this functional lung density analysis comes in. And I think once we apply the structural analysis overlay on top of this, we can see that even though each of these patients are gold two, that structurally they present in a very different physical phenotypical manner where subject A is mostly normal and functional tissue. So how would I treat this patient? We probably do smoking cessation if we haven't already uh, and COPD management. We have subject B, which they still have some normal and functional, but they have more destruction across their lung fields. And this is more presented in a homogenous way. So smoking cessation, sure, COPD management, but probably need to see if we can enroll them in clinical trials uh, for biologics. Subject C, most of the focus point seems to be on the left lower lobe. Perhaps this patient is a candidate for uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction via valves as long as they meet the patient selection criteria. Uh, and then subject D opens the, the possibilities up a little bit. We have a bilateral upper lobe involvement. Most of the emphysematic tissue and functional tissue is in the upper lobes. Do I deploy valves to both the upper lobes? Do I just deploy to the one that's more hyperinflated? If we have an incidental finding of a lung nodule up in the right upper lobe, is a thoracic surgeon really going to be concerned with removing that tissue if it's not really applying much to functionality? So I want to move then into looking at the differences as an example for three different patients. So first, we're going to just look at standard grayscale CT information, and we're going to be looking at 
what we consider to be a normal patient. And then we have an example for gold one and we have an example for gold three. Uh, and then Greg, I would just like your analysis as radiologist. Sure. What, what do you see here? Sure. And I'll I'll call an audible here and we'll I'll pick up the pace and and we'll go through these three cases very quickly because I want to make sure we leave time for, for questions. But fundamentally these single coronal images um, demonstrate subtle changes uh, in the gold one patient in the middle. Um, you know, again, these aren't axials, which is normally how I would look at them, but but it's definitely compared to the normal, some early, uh, probably some early central lobular change, whereas the gold three, as we expect, has a pretty significant destruction in the bilateral upper lobe symmetrically with with decent preservation of the right middle slash lower lobe and the left lower lobe. Thank you, Greg. So this is looking at grayscale analysis, and now we'll look at this, the structural, this lung density analysis, the functional lung density analysis. So now we can see that we have, we have a visual perspective here in the coronal, looking at the normal gold one and gold three, and now we're actually able to quantify the tissue densities to be able to see that normal looks fairly good. Gold one is actually starting to see some involvement to uh, total lung field emphysematic tissue. Uh, and then gold three, uh, if it's not relatively apparent that red is bad, we can see that this patient is split in thirds across normal air trapping uh, and emphysema. And then we can break this down even further by looking at some of those metrics as far as how do we differentiate across these. Well, for our normal patient with mostly 89% normal tissue and 10% functional, no emphysema with some mild air trapping. But then when we look at gold one and we can start to see that we have some more conversion from normal tissue into functional and persistent tissue that we would consider this to be mild diffuse emphysema with some moderate air trapping. And then for our gold three, upper lobe dominant emphysema that shows significant air trapping, if that wasn't already apparent from uh, the structural overlay. And now we apply the lung ventilation analysis software on top of this. And now again, we were looking at the difference in how does the ventilation distribute across these patients' lung fields? Again, green being good, normal, red being areas of underventilation, and blue being areas of uh, high ventilation or compensation. And we can see that we have their VDP and their heterogeneity, and not a big difference between the healthy control and the gold one. But what there is, is a little bit of a difference in, we see an area of compensation that is starting to occur down here in the right middle, right lower lobe. Uh, and then as we jump over to gold three in terms of distribution of ventilation, there's really nothing occurring in this patient's upper lobes. Most of the distribution of ventilation has shifted down into the bases. This VDP is incredibly high. And Greg, I don't know about you, but this is one of the biggest ventilation heterogeneities I've ever seen. Right. Uh, yeah. And so, <clears throat> Greg, we're going to put all three of these together. Yep. And I'm happy to <clears throat> Please talk. do. Yep. And this will this will take us home. This is our last slide. Um and and so I, I as a thought experiment, I, I'm you know excited for you to consider the possibility that every time a, a traditional standard high resolution chest CT is ordered, every single time, even retrospectively, the opportunity exists for you to extract all this additional information, which is already latent in that study. Um, now we have talked a lot about um, unexplained dyspnea, and that is certainly a big application. We have, uh, I would say the other half of what we do are related to very specific diseases with very specific phenotypes of structure, uh, ventilation, heterogeneity, and, uh, and quantitative evaluation, where you can look at early treatment. You can, you can certainly drive treatment. You can look at appropriateness for treatment. You can look at early treatment response. And, 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 you know, those fields, we've only talked about COPT, COPD today, but interstitial disease, uh, uh, inhalational illnesses, you remember our very first picture uh, had uh, a gentleman uh, wearing his BDUs, his, his army uh, camouflage, and we work uh, uh, with the VA and uh, looking at what's called deployment-related respiratory disease, for which we've developed uh, a ventilation heterogeneity phenotype. And so, again, from a practical perspective, the idea that this information is available at initial evaluation and for follow-up evaluation to determine early treatment response uh, in line with your current practices, in line with your current tools, um, with your radiology partners or directly to you, 
Um, we integrate this into traditional workflows, integrate this into traditional imaging studies. Uh, David and I, as you remember from our bios, both come from the practical high volume healthcare world. And our interest is in seeing how significant changes can be made, as I said at the beginning, using tools that are available now. So um, that's our presentation. I, I, I know I speak for David when I, you know, when I thank you for your attendance that you, you stuck this out on a Friday night. Um, I hope it was a good use of your time and we would love to answer any questions or hear your comments or take your advice or what, what have you. So thanks again for all of your attention and time. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Fantastic presentation. Uh, this is the portion of the program where I hope to buy folks a few moments of time to think about some questions, comments. You know, one of the really powerful parts of our CTS community is our collaboration together. And I really liked how they just offered the opportunity for questions, but also for comments, recommendations, suggestions. At the same time, Sometimes we have very thorough presentations and they answer many of your questions. So we understand, but would love to hear from our audience if you have questions or comments. So thank you. It looks like the first few questions have come in. I'm gonna yep. go ahead and read this first question aloud and then uh, whoever would like to answer, I'll leave it up to you. So the question is, other than obstructive lung disease, what other diseases can benefit from this technique? It's a great question. Um, we, uh, for instance, we are the world, the global partner of of um, uh, of Olympus, and other. Uh, we work with several drug companies in using our tool as a companion diagnostic. So, uh, interstitial lung disease, fibrotic lung diseases are uh, very much part of the quanti quantitation effort that we presented. We've shown you um, mostly here the approach to uh, unexplained dyspnea, but um, we have a suite of tools beyond these two that uh, again are, are used on the basis of, of your existing imaging equipment to both quantify and evaluate subtle changes. For instance, functional small airways disease um, has very specific phenotypes related to ventilation heterogeneity. So, um, so there, there's, there's quite a number of other approaches. Um, we use, the, uh, and, and I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know, David, if you have any comment that you'd like to add before we go to the next two questions. Oh, no, that was great, Greg. Go ahead. So next question, um, are there age or size limits to this evaluation? Uh, an example would be for pediatrics. There are no uh, size limits per se, so that's not an issue. Um, uh, in terms of age limits, the I'm going to actually, since that has a that has a regulatory component in FDA clearance, and honestly, I'm I'm unsure whether we are FDA cleared using the CT technology uh, in pediatric patients. I don't know, David, if you know the answer to that question. No, I think for for the CT technology, we are in the FDA clearance, uh, which surprisingly to me, it's 22 years or older uh, is what we are clear for. As far as size goes, I would say that as long as the patient can fit in the CT scanner, it should be fine. Uh, otherwise, yeah. for pediatric utilization, it would have to be under research or IRB. Great. Thank you for taking your best stab at answering that question. Um, next question. How long does the process take from receiving the CT scan and finally creating the output and sending back? Yes, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> there are two uh, there are two calculations that are being used. Our technology is already in use at um, in several hundred sites um, and and uh, used uh, in in significant volume, running in the background in a non disruptive way. So that's sort of that that's sort of you know out there already. Um, the 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 quantitative measures are processed. Uh, in all effectively in real time, the quantitative measures are read out um, within much less time than most traditional cloud-based applications. So there's really no clinical delay um, in the quantitative measures. The, the functional measure is a cloud-based analysis 
Um, generally, uh, it returns in one to two hours, but we are uh, we are now uh, on pace for that to be in about 15 minutes um, as we uh, through some significant, let's say, acquisitions that we've had. So we use this routinely in um, outpatient imaging um, where the cases are often not read until the next day. But by our SNA of this year, which is the radiology, um, the radiology conference, uh, we expect that to be down below 30 minutes into the 15 minute zone. Uh, great, thank you for that answer. Uh, the next question, um, any place for pulmonary vascular disease? I'm assuming use cases. Yeah, and these are the next two questions um, are actually uh, in the same, in the same uh, area. We currently have, uh, before the FDA, uh, two-thirds of, of uh, their requirement of a, th of a three uh, patient group to evaluate non-contrast pulmonary, uh, uh, non-contrast perfusion. So um, we will, uh, we, we've, we've already collected enough cases to produce reliable perfusion maps um, in chronic disease, uh, uh, chronic lung disease, in, in lung interventions, surgical volume reductions, et cetera. Um, and we are collecting the final cases in, uh, in CTEF and, and uh, pulmonary embolic disease. So the same, um, the, the technology to provide effectively a SPECT VQ um, with uh, your inspiratory expiratory CT with no inhaled contrast, no injected contrast. Um, our FDA submission will be no later than February of this year. We've already given several presentations on this recently at ATS, um, recently at ERS and uh, other, other societies. We could um, certainly direct you to those papers. We intend to be uh, on the market with a spec CT equivalent non-contrast VQ scan before the end of next year. Thank you. And and the second question that followed that I believe he addressed was, can pulmonary vascular evaluations be combined with the functional data? And and yeah. and that 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 VQ scan will be uh, exactly that. So um, so uh, if if you don't have access to uh, to a nuclear medicine scan of that sort, if you um, have access, but it takes a lot more than 15 minutes um, to get um, and having those uh, interpreted, you know, our, our goal is to uh, essentially give you quantitative uh, perfusion and, and, and exactly the quantitative, um, the, 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 the functional ventilation maps and the quantitative maps all in one go with every inspiratory, expiratory CT that you order. And Greg, I want to add to that. I know you said non-contrast, but also no radioisotopes. Correct. Certainly. No, you're right. No, but correct. This is entirely without injectable um, uh, radiopharmaceuticals, IV contrast. Um, this takes even retrospectively your existing non-contrast inspiratory expiratory paired CT and essentially returns you a SPECT VQ scan. That's incredibly useful. We have just a minute or two more if anyone has a final final question are you also using ai good question uh, um the tools that we showed you tonight um are actually using a uh, mathematical calculation not ai um brute force high level math i assure you that that i don't pretend to understand um based on aviation physics and and mathematical modeling uh, however, as I've mentioned before, in addition to the specific tools that I showed you tonight, we have a portfolio of around 11 FDA approved technologies. And we do have technologies that are using AI, um, especially for uh, uh, incidental findings. Uh, we, we do uh, coronary artery uh, calcius calcification scoring. Um, and we were given FDA breakthrough designation for um, a, uh, a, an AI diagnostic tool that specifically will identify uh, UIP, 
um, in, in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. There's others, and um, we'd be happy at any time uh, if 